Welcome to the first episode of What's Art Got to Do With It? This is going to be an ongoing series of conversations with creators, artists, and others um, about how art can inspire us to become more curious about our own lives and expand how we see the world around us. And I am so, so, so pleased to have Cheryl as the, my first guest on the debut of this series. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome. Uh, Thank a, you. A dear friend, one of my artistic mentors, I'm so grateful that you're here to kick this off with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Deb, really. Cheryl, you are a fine art painter living in Provincetown, Massachusetts. You are the recipient of numerous awards, scholarships, and grants. You've studied with masters. You have previously owned your own gallery on Commercial Street. And you are the co-producer of the documentary Art Spirit, which, in full disclosure, we <laughs> co-produced together with our very good friend, Lauren Klesiak, who is here with us this evening. That doesn't begin to do you justice, uh, who you are in the world, but it is yeah. the, a beginning and gets us into the, the conversation. <laughs> so yeah, well, we have a history, Deb, <laughs> and Lauren. And I'm, uh, yeah, it's, it's been an awesome ride. Yeah, it really, it really has, and we're still riding. Still yeah. Riding. <laughs> Long live the olives. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, um, so Cheryl, this, let's just get into it. Have you always felt that you have been an artist? I think I, I was just, when I was really, I was very young, and there was a girl that lived across the street from me, maybe three years older than me, four years maybe, uh, her name was Betsy Legozo, and she, uh, I used to hang out with her brother, Johnny, because I was a tomboy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but when I would go over there, I'd go and I'd see Betsy in her room, and she had all these art supplies, and she would be watercoloring and pencils, and I would always be stopping at her door and just watching. And she was actually the one that took me under her wing. Uh, when I was like nine years old or 10 years old and uh, took me out oil painting, sitting in a snowbank and <laughs> taught me how to mix colors and use turpentine back in those days. It was awesome. That's great. It's such a great testament to who we are in the world because who we are in the world enables someone else to become who they who they can truly be, be in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm forever grateful to her. She validated for me uh, at a very young age that, you know, one, it was okay to be creative and be an artist and, you know, go down that path. And she made it fun. And, um, you know, here I am still doing it. <laughs> still doing it. So t let's talk a little bit about that process because you had a little detour. You had a career, a good career. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And... Yeah. Uh, then what happened? <laughs> I was kind of a free spirit for a long time. I was hitchhiking and traveling and, you know, I, I, I quit college after a couple of years and uh, just wanted to like get out and see the world basically and <laughs> ended up in Colorado and I lived there for 11 years and it was just awesome. And I had all these different jobs, restaurant jobs. I mean, gosh, I did everything. And there was one day where I was uh, a line cook in this restaurant in Wallingford, Connecticut called Jonathan Jay's. And I came out to get a uh, soda or something in the bar and I just stopped and I just said, man, what am I doing? I got to go back to, I have to, I, I, I got to go back to school or something. So I got my portfolio together and went to the Dean of Pear College of Art. And, you know, just talked talk to him and s told him how badly I wanted to get back into the arts. And I got accepted and ended up with a degree and got a job at Gamma One, which was my corporate job for almost 13 years in North Haven. But it was still an art art job. It was more graphic oriented. Yeah, but, graphic design. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you did that for 13 years and you continued on your revolutionary path as as an artist and what what was it was there a, was there a particular moment in time was there a turning point something that really enabled you to, to pivot into saying you know what I want to be an artist full-time like how did how did that happen 
You know, in that 13 years of working uh, in a graphic production job, uh, we were a beta site for the for the country and a lot of different new software. And it was the learning curve was was steep, and it was uh, always cutting edge. And I it, I dug it for a long time. After I'd say 12 years, I I realized I was getting uh, burnt out. I was in the hot seat. Everybody needed everything yesterday. <laughs> uh, if you're in production, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, um, and so I just said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I have to leave this. So I didn't have a backup plan. It was just, I had a couple months worth of finances, you know, to set me up a little bit. Yep. And the first thing I did when I gave my notice and left my corporate job and tossed it to the wind, I um, got very involved in the whole New Haven, Connecticut art scene from taking painting classes to, you know, even getting back into acting. And, um, mm. and it was just, I just immersed myself in the arts again, because it always took a back seat, yeah. you know, to my career. Yeah, absolutely. What then eventually brought you to that narrow spit of sand in the middle of the ocean, that beautiful, beautiful place that we like to call P-Town. Yep. Well, I had, I had had a year off. I had immersed myself in, like I said, theater I, it, and painting. And it was just like, I think I'm going to just go to P-Town. I was here in the 70s, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I really never really grasped the whole scene as far as an art colony. And so I came here for the summer. And uh, I had tossed my career to the wind, and it was a lot of things going on, you know. Um, my landlord said I had six weeks to get out because he needed to live in my apartment. So everything was stored and sold and down, you know, I just totally um, purged. Timing. And, Timing. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes. And yeah. I don't think, I don't think it was, uh, you know, I don't think it was random. I think it I was know. definitely a trajectory. Yeah. Was where, what my purpose was. And so I came to Provincetown, found a little uh, shack at Beach Point and, for the summer. And there I was all of a sudden, boom, I'm here. <laughs> and honestly, I never left. Mm -hmm. And I've been here 20 years. So yeah, yeah it's been, it's been, a, it's been a great ride. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, cheers to that very bold move. And thank you just all of the great success that you've had along the way. You've been my artistic mentor all along. You reach a point where you cannot not do it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> People say, oh my God, that must have been like so hard for you to leave your, your corporate job after that many years. And I'm like, the decision was so easy. It was like, it was a no brainer. You know, it gets to that point where it's like, yes. Yeah. This, this is it. Our friend Lauren Klesiak is asking, why P-Town? Why P-Town? Good question, because when I did toss my career to the wind, I had five locations that I was looking at to relocate. Mm -hmm. uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, San Francisco, Burlington, Vermont. But it wasn't here. Wow. It certainly wasn't here. I, and... didn't know, I don't think I ever knew that. That's wild. Yeah, all of those places had one thing in com a couple things in common. One, they were all university towns, and they had mm -hmm. they were holistic, um, and they had a great cultural vibe, and that's what I was really interested in. And then I came here, and it was like, oh my god, <laughs> I had no idea it was the longest continuous art colony in America, and I, I kind of just stepped into it, and just this became it was automatically, oh yeah, this is it. This is my home. Yeah. You paint a number of, of different ways. And I'm curious how you have felt that your work inter interacts with the world as you've gone through your evolution as an artist while you've been down there for these past 20 years. You, you paint figurative nudes. You're, you're doing lots of uh, birds, these amazing bird paintings now. You've done abstracts and others. I'm, I'm just curious if you could just talk a little bit about your process and how you move from one 
just one subject area to another. Why that may be necessary for you or how that manifests for you? Yeah, that's a great question, Deb. You know, one thing about, you know, trying to tap into the gallery scene was people wanted if gallery owners wanted a cohesive body of work, do you paint landscapes? Do you paint this? So that, and I understand that being sure, a gallery sure. owner that, you know, when you're hanging a show, you want it to be consistent, but I could never, I never got that being locked into one thing. So, I mean, there's a time when I was very political and just painting everything I was feeling about what was going on in the world. And then uh, after I got that out of my system, then it was just, you know, I've always watched birds since I was a little girl. So, I mean, it was inevitable that that was going to be, become a series. Um, and I, le I learned so much from nature anyway, the spatial relationship mm -hmm. as, they, as they land on the wire. And I think one of the biggest things is being an, an observer. Mm -hmm. that, that is the, the key component. Um, and that being that observer led me down different avenues, you know, like I had time to really look at, you know, you know, birds. I had time to really look at how women were historically treated mm -hmm. over many, 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 many thousands and gazillion years. And that uh, empowerment took hold in, in the work that I was doing. Uh, my female figures, which I tend to say is my forte because I love to paint the figure. Love it. And when I am in the studio with a live model, it's really a, an amazing process. Mm. And, and the female figure resembles a landscape, mm. you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I never wanted to get locked into one, one forte or box or anything. Like you can't do that to me. You know what I'm <laughs> I, I totally, <laughs> I totally, I, I totally get it because I'm. Don't I'm, lock I'm, me in. Don't anymore. no, don't box me in. No, I, I don't think. I think I think artists go through different periods where something really calls to you, and you just, you know, you mix with it, and you you become one with it. You study it, you paint it, you try it all different ways, and then, and then there's something else that's calling, and you have to you have to just see that through. That's it. You just hit it on the head. It's a calling. Yeah. It's a yeah. calling and it gnaws at you. And then you have no other choice but to say, you know, I have to paint this. Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah, you, you have to. <laughs> you have to. And, you know, it makes me sad that there might be some artists who have that feeling. And maybe that they don't do it because they are maybe they got themselves locked into a particular genre. They do really well with a certain type of art. And, you know, I hope if you're watching out there, you, you have to go for it. Wondering if there's a if there's a correlation between what you paint and your love of life. I think it's one and the same. Yeah, I think it's so closely related that I can't even decipher, you know, one from the other. It's they're just they just merge. Right. You know? Yeah, I totally get that. How, how do you think your work interacts with the world? So that, you know, we, we're understanding you as the artist and how, how your work interacts with you as the artist, but what have you, have you learned anything in terms of how your work interacts with the world? Has that taught you anything? If there's one thing I learned, and I never want to stop learning, by the way, um, is just put it out there. Because mm -hmm. the world needs it, yeah. You know, especially in these times. Oh my goodness! You, if you feel something deeply and you put it out, you 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 create something. You know, there's always a place for it in the world. Yeah, it's your voice. It's something you have to say. Yeah, and so it's so important for you to, to for for artists to really do that. You know, just put it out there, especially with social media now. I know you could just post your work online and you know, who knows, who knows who's going to see it. It's not, not necessarily for the, all about the sale. Uh, although that's wonderful. Yep. And that's how we live, but it's also like, wow, I love how this person just captured this essence and was able to create something like that. Yeah. So, 
Are there artists that have that you're you know comfortable naming that have really inspired you that have shown you the way, if you will? In terms of masters, I've been very influenced by well, of course, Vincent Van Gogh from a young age, Matisse. Uh, let's see, Diebenkorn, Richard Diebenkorn, <laughs> Picasso, and Robert Motherwell as <laughs> the last latest one i've just so blown away and i'm so grateful that i live in a place where this is one of those places where you just you, you meet so many artists and you're able to talk about your work with them and they are to you so like painting with cynthia packard taking a workshop with her is is like going to church you know <laughs> it's like you're yeah. so you're so in the zone for for three days and it's it's so moving and so inspiring. It's just, a, it's, you know, so to name a few, the Packard family, obviously, um, gosh, there's just so many. Cynthia, she did that live series on Facebook when the pandemic hit and wow. I, yeah, she's a great teacher. Talk about going to church. I mean, just to be able to witness her in the studio and just to be able to witness her in the zone. Yeah, exactly. And she puts that amount of energy uh, into her workshops with her students. It's just, I'll bet. It's, it's great. Yeah. I'll bet. I think I, I, think I want to teach someday. You know what, Cheryl? I was just thinking, I think you'd be a fabulous teacher. You I, think so? I really do. You could do it online. Everything's going online. You know, COVID has changed the world. You could do a series. People would pay for it. It'd be great. I I'll, know. I'll well, say. I, I think. <laughs> I, I think I told you that uh, someone had contacted me in regard to them starting homeschooling with their kids because of this whole COVID thing. And uh, I, I was asked to be the like art teacher twice a month, you know, uh, online. I wow. Think that's like... So then maybe that's your entree. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. You know, it's one thing I fear the most. You know, I, I, if, I, if I'm going to fear one thing, am I good enough to teach? I don't know. I don't, you know, I go through this, uh, that, that self-doubt, like we all do, but um, I really think I would really enjoy teaching people. I hope you'll give that some thought, and I hope you'll be inspired by not only me and this conversation, but the, the folks on, right, on this that are watching right now are saying, yes, you should teach. Oh, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you, everybody. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, Cheryl, so you have, you have large and small canvases that you paint and panels and so forth. You were also chosen to paint a mural down in P-Town. Yeah. Oh, my God. What a blast. <laughs> it was five feet by 25 feet. I never did anything that large. And um, the new manager at the time, Melinda... McCarthy at Stop and Shop said, you know, we live in an art colony. We should have art on our walls. And I thought, <laughs> geez, from a corporate standpoint, she's just thinking outside the box. I love it. Yeah. You know, I'd love the opportunity to do something like that. She says, well, come to me with a design or something and uh, we'll talk about it. So I did. In the winter, when the store closed, I'd go in. They got scaffolding for me. And I, I put a a call out to people in the community asking, hey, you have any old house paint around? <laughs> and I, I was floored with uh, responses and I just picked up all this old house paint and that was that was what I used for my palette. And it, painted uh, a, a mural at Stop It Shop called <laughs> You've Arrived. I, that's such a great title. And when you see the piece, when you see that mural on the wall, that's exactly when you come up up over that that little hill, and then yeah. there it is. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's so, just it's fabulous. Yeah. It was a blast. <laughs> Total blast. It's so great. I'm reading this really cool book, Originals, by Adam Grant, and he talks about original thinking and how how necessary it is, you know. And it's one of the it's one of the inspirations for me starting this series is that. The arts really does enable us to grow with our own curiosity, with the way we see, like we get to see how somebody else sees the world. 
and it gives us an, a moment, it gives us pause. I was just talking with a, with a friend the other day about her art and there were little hearts in there and she didn't see them. Like there are these little hearts in there, you know? It's like, you never know what somebody's gonna see. I never cease to be fa fascinated by how other people see the world and then of course see art. And as an artist, we get to share how we see the world with others. Right. And that, I believe, in turn, really allows others then to, to sort of take up the mantle and say, Exactly. I have a way. I, I see the world a certain way, whether it's with words, language, right? Whether it's with a paintbrush, whether it's with exactly. farming. It uh, doesn't matter. Any, any yeah. form. could even be food, right? It's whatever. Exactly. It exactly. You, it gives you that permission and that inspiration. And right. I, I'm wondering how original thinking it sort of comes natural to you, it seems to me, but is it anything that you've given thought to? Absolutely. And there was one show I was in, in uh, it was like maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And I had, uh, it, was, it, was, it was all my um, nudes and my figures, but I did this one piece with a palette knife and very loose and very abstract. And I had someone come up to me and say, out of all this work here, this is the most mature. I looked at that and I went, wow. And mm -hmm. what I got out of that was I, I have been in the room with models, so I'm rendering the model, but it was my interpretation that set it apart. Yep. And that I think is the key. We have a clean slate and as artists, we, can either render exactly what we see. Personally, I think it's more interesting when you come from a place of total interpretation, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, you know, right. yep. and, and it could be abstract or, or it could be realistic, but it's, you have interpreted it, whatever it is. Right. And, and then rendered it. And I think it's one of the reasons why we, you know, so many of us really just love going to museums or looking through art books or going online and just looking at art because you look at the way somebody saw something or the way somebody interpreted it with original thinking. Right. And sometimes it just blows you away. It can bring you to tears. It can just, this, the psychologist Robert McRae is quoted in the book uh, Originals and it says he, he's quoted the most open-minded people experience aesthetic chills, shivers, and goosebumps when appreciating art or hearing beautiful music. And it's so true. Going to a, a live performance, uh, it's a holy experience. Totally. Like when I hear the cello, it's like I could drop to my knees. And I think when you can allow yourself to be moved by art, when you can feel that, when it, when it viscerally goes right through you. Yeah. Uh, you know, do, if you can let art do that, if you can experience that with art, then, then maybe, just maybe, you can experience that with a, a slightly differing point of view. You know, like you might be more willing to just, tr you know, look at something a little differently or... Yeah. And it's not, always, it's not always a pleasant experience. That's right. You know, so, I mean, I, I, I have experiences where it's very, uh, very painful. It was very difficult um, to 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 process and to to put it on canvas or to put it in in a sculpture. If you're really tormented by something, it and you know it definitely triggers your creative uh, instincts as well as like oh my god, I'm so moved. It's so beautiful. Yeah, you know so. That's why we need art in the world. Yes, we do. It helps us with our fears. It helps us with, yeah, so much. Cheryl, you touched on this a little bit with respect to your figurative nudes, but I'm curious if you, if you can just say a little bit more about how the natural world has influenced your art through the years. The natural world, meaning um, just being in nature, right? Being and in nature, or what what you see, what you what you're breathing in. Yeah, you know, I was I always got in trouble in school <laughs> for daydreaming. I, my head was my face was always out the window. I I I didn't pay attention a lot. I think I was always an observer. Mm -hmm. I would sit quietly and watch and watch. I remember as a kid, like, 
watching the construction guys tar a road and put a curb in, like that fascinates me. But I think being the observer and that observer part of myself gave me the hunger to travel mm. and see, see different parts of the world because I knew my little world growing up in Marion, Connecticut, uh, blue collar town. I knew it was bigger. It was, it was so big. So, I, you know, that, that uh, observer took me to being a uh, adrenaline junkie where I did some crazy stuff in my life, but it, all of that, all of that uh, was in the natural world, you know, mm -hmm. like climbing Kilimanjaro or trekking in Nepal for, you know, 21 days. I only made it 16, though, because I got helicopter rescued out. These are big things. Cerebral edema. These are big things. Not Kilimanjaro, not Kilimanjaro. These are big, big, <laughs> big accomplishments. <laughs> but even, you know, my, I think, so, and even in survival courses that I took, Mm. Where you're up, you're you're setting out on a desert in Utah, and all you have is a knife, a little bottle of water purification uh, drops, and a cup. Wow! You're you're in the elements. You're put against nature, and it's you know most amazing way. You're 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 stepping into this like world of, oh my God, what what do I need? Right. You know? Right. And all of that just plays into my choices in terms of what I choose to paint, what I choose to mm -hmm. to do. Um, it, it's it's all relative. I'm I'm just so grateful that I I was able to have those experiences. Yeah. I still haven't I still haven't uh, dived with the great white shark yet. So <laughs> that's next. And it is Shark Week. It is Shark Week. Which I think it's so perfect that we're here tonight. Yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, and just think of the art that's going to come out of that. <laughs> oh, my God. No. Uh, my shark series. <laughs> Is there anything that you've learned about your art or even about your own life through the lens of another artist's work? When you're truly inspired by, by another artist, like I have been with uh, lately with Robert Motherwell, and when I see the technique that Cynthia Packard uses, not that you want to emulate them, but it, it, it stirs your, your, your creative mental process, and you want to, you know, it's, it's something's calling to you with those artists. Right. There's a reason that they inspire you. So, so something's energetically vibrating to say, wow. You know, maybe you should try this. Or have there been like really difficult, difficult moments with respect to being an artist? And it can be about just going into the studio and not knowing what the hell you're going to do. It can be anything, anything at all. But like, there's so many good things about being an artist. And there are also so many things about being an artist. I have definitely experienced being tormented by it. Well, I live with depression. All right, so that right there is, uh, I'm challenged, even though, you know, I finally got on meds and I have been for a long time, but uh, it creeps in and there are certain things that present themselves as a challenge. And does it affect your creativity? Absolutely. Hmm. Um, but you work through it. And some of my best, some of the best stuff comes from those really dark places, I, I have to say. So um, I don't want to poo-poo that either. You right. know? I just say, if you feel it, paint it. You know yeah. what I mean? Absolutely, Cheryl. Thank, yep. you for, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. That's yeah, you're very welcome. Curious if there's, if there's a book, Change Your Life? Or... Yeah, uh, let's see. Lust for Life was a, mm. a book early on in my life that uh, when I was in Colorado, I read it. I was early 20s or late teens, early 20s, living in Colorado. And uh, I lived his life. You know mm. what I mean? Like I only ate yeah. black bread and I only drank black coffee, <laughs> and, you know, for like weeks. <laughs> you know, and so I, I, I wanted to see what that was like. And um, yeah. with Vincent Van Gogh's life. And uh, uh, let's see. 
Oh gosh, there's so many. Of course, all my art books. I just, um, I'm more visual, Deb, but I do enjoy reading, but I, I, I'm, I'm so much more visual that I, I will pick up an art book before I picked up a novel. And the art book is, is, is full of stories. That's, that's just a different way of expressing a story. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Expressing a vision. Um, What's your favorite book? Oh my God. I don't even know where the hell to begin on that. On that. You know what? I will, I'll just put another plug in for this book because I'm reading it right now. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass. It's by um, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I will tell you, for me, it's like scripture. She's changing the way that I am looking at and experiencing the natural world. Everything from beans to, to sweet grass. She's coming from an indigenous culture perspective as well as from a botanist perspective. So she's got the science and she's got yeah. the quality of the indigenous culture. And she's a, a really great writer. And so she's sharing all of this wisdom and the scientific knowledge. And I'm learning so, mu so much about plants and just I don't step out into the natural world the same way again. So highly recommend it. I keep plugging Robin Wall. And one day, you know what? Maybe I'll just have her on it. Come yeah. Hey, you never know. <laughs> and then when I, next time I come to your house, you're going to be serving sweet grass and beans. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love it, Deb. Oh. Oh, I, I think it's awesome. Yes. Anytime we have an aha moment where uh, something pokes out at us that is different from yeah. the way we've thought about something or think about things. Yeah. It's like, I love that. That forces your thought process to go and, you know, really <laughs> open up when you're discussing that with other people. It's awesome. Yeah. And you've had that, Cheryl, and you have been down there in the schoolhouse I had the uh, good fortune of being able to sit in that, the, the old Cape Cod School of Art barn mm -hmm. and um, sit around that pot belly stove and sipping wine and having these heady discussions, with, which is what happened, you know, back in the day. Someone, someone just asked a question. They want to know how you're, how you're doing since you closed your gallery. Uh, I miss it terribly, you know, mm -hmm. just like every Friday night was like having a uh, social party at my in my living room with that red sofa and uh, highlighting one of the artists that was being featured. I miss Jim Broussard and Christine Sullivan and, mm. you know, my dad who did his yes. uh, little sculptures, uh, wood, wood carvings, um, Eric Beck. I mean, I, I miss all my artists and I miss the kids a lot, you know, during family week. Yeah. Uh, so that I miss, but the, the hours, Oh my God. I work six double shifts and I don't miss that at all. I feel like I have a lot more freedom and I'm focusing on my own work right now, which is really great. Eight years was uh, a, a great run. Catherine Roos, you may know her. She said yeah. she misses you in the gallery. Oh, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> I miss you too. That red sofa that you had in your gallery. Oh and you, yeah. You had people sit on that sofa and you took photos. And, are you still like working on that book? I am, I am. I know it's taking forever, but it, I will have it. I, I hope to have it done by the fall. If not the fall, in the spring. <laughs> That's hey, gonna be fabulous. That, this gonna, it'll fun. happen when it's supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah. Just, just beautiful. What a, what a great tribute to your time with the gallery to all of those artists who passed through, to your friends. I, I just think that book is going to be so special. Thank you, Deb. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I can't wait. All right, are you ready for the lightning round questions? Okay, <laughs> here we go. This is Deb's artist, uh, what do you call it? Oh, the artist studio questions. Y yeah, yeah, like the actor studio with oh, James. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm inspired, so I love that show. Oh, you can still watch them on YouTube. Um, Christine Sullivan said, can't wait for your book. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you, Chris. So what makes you awestruck? Makes you say, wow. What makes me say, wow. Listen, if I were in a shark cage and I was this close to that big black eye, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would be awestruck. <laughs> You know, I'm also, I'm also awestruck 
when I see those little effervescent little, uh, I don't know what you call them, luminaries that, that, mm. that, that sit on the water's edge. Yes. Yeah. Time of year. This is the time of year where they're out, but it's like, wow, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. 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 Nature. You yeah. Know, hard not to be awestruck by the things we find in nature. Yeah. Okay. What's the kindest thing someone has ever done for you? <gasps> oh my gosh. The kindest thing someone has ever done for me. There's been so many people are so, they're just so kind. I feel terrible that I, I can't think of just, you know, one. Maybe that's okay. Yeah. I don't know. Kind. Oh my God. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. And I think it says everything that there have been so many that it's hard to just. Oh, totally. So, yeah. so that's just. A, that's I'll tell you one. My friend, Jen Rumsa. Uh, I just lost my little cat mm. and, and um, Patisco and Jen Rumsa came to my house and she brought me a little painting that she did of her. Oh, and you know, it was just like, Oh my God, that was a gift. Yes. You know, things like that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What, you know, and that's a great example of how we can give like a gift doesn't have, you don't have to go to the store and buy something. You can make something. Right. Oh, I love that. that that's greatest, the best. Those are the greatest gifts of all. Yeah. yeah. Plus, my wife Dot is always giving me th great things. So we love Dot. Hi, we Dot. love Dot. Yes. <laughs> um. What is your? Do you have a favorite tree? A favorite what? Tree. Tree. Oh. <laughs> I, my favorite tree. I don't know the different species of them, but um, those big gnarly hmm. big, big huge trunk trees where you know they're old souls yeah you know been here they've been there for oh my god yeah eons and they're yeah. deeply rooted and uh yes i am a tree hugger <laughs> me too um, yeah <laughs> and uh i love i love those 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 kinds of trees that you know wow uh, what they have, what they have seen over the years. You know what I mean? Oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Here are some fun ones. Uh, what is your favorite smell? Oh, driving on an old country road and smelling manure. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love that. Get you it. Know, when you're driving yeah. by cow pastures and it's just like, whoa, that's great. And also, also a freshly, uh, mowed lawn. Mm, yes. I miss that. There's not much lawns here in Provincetown. A lot of sand, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's great. Love it. What's your least favorite smell? Uh, least favorite smell is uh, something gone bad in the refrigerator <laughs> and I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> or tuna sandwich that's been in my truck for couple of weeks i'm like oh my god i forgot about this yeah yeah there's things in the fridge they blend in and you can't oh my god yeah yeah so that's like yeah i don't like that all right and the last question is what is your favorite kitchen utensil <gasps> okay my favorite kitchen utensil is um my mother had she loved to decorate cakes hmm. she loved to she loved to bake she took a, a cake decorating a class and we had this old uh, frosting applicator. I don't know what you call yeah. it. It's like with a really long uh, silver uh, thing, so you like, can like a tube. Had the, had the yeah 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 it's yeah. So you could smear the the frosting around a cake. Yep yep yeah that thing. Ah, oh. I don't know what it's called, but I still have it, and uh, I use it in my studio to wow. apply paint. I'll smear paint around uh, the canvas, and um, that works. And I always think of her. Hi, Irene. Great. So beautiful. Beautiful. Cheryl, thank you. Thank, thank you. So You're much. not going to ask me my best, my favorite word? What's your favorite word? Some on the beach. <laughs> what does that say it again? Some on the beach. <laughs> Some on the beach. <laughs> it's, it's an Italian word. <laughs>
Hey, Deb, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm so grateful. And if you, you can follow Cheryl on Instagram at um, hashtag SROCKART, S-R-O-C-C-A-R-T, 22257, and I'll post her info. For artists out there, just keep on doing what you're doing because we, we need it. And, yep. uh, yes, and, we we're, and we're all interested in what you have to say. Yeah, so. we, yeah. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And thank you, Deb. Uh, I thank you for helping me kick this this uh, series off. I'm so I'm so thrilled to be doing this, and I'll be back in two weeks with my uh, guest Tim Dillinger Curitan. Um, he's a singer songwriter and song catcher. He's a partner at Imagination Fury Arts and a musical historian, and he'll be joined by his husband Ray Curitan Dillinger. And uh, Ray is a Nashville recording artist and a partner at Imagination Fury Art. Sure to be another great conversation. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for watching. Remember, we need art. We need creativity. We need your imaginations to see the world differently and overcome the status quo. That's right. Stay wild. Stay wild. What's <laughs> art got to do with it? Got to do with it. <laughs> Bye, Deb. Love you. Love you. All right. Thanks, everybody.